Good morning. I'm Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park, and uh, this is a continuation of our uh, COVID-19 worship, uh, where we worship by conference call, and I'm also putting the Bible text and the sermon uh, on YouTube for anybody else to enjoy who couldn't make it the first time. So uh, we're starting a new series this morning on uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians. And um, I'm going to begin just by giving a little background to how uh, he wound up in Philippi in the first place from Acts chapter 16, starting at verse 6. It says that they went through the region of uh, Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. You know, odd phrase, we don't know what that means, but their plans obviously were to continue to preach on the Asia side of Turkey, and um, somehow that didn't happen. Um, and uh, then they says they went, they came up to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus did not allow them. You know, another occasion where a possibility or a door closed. Um, and uh, so passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia, that's northern Greece, um, was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately he sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called uh, them to preach the gospel there. And uh, that's exactly what they do. There's a lovely story in Acts 16 about how they come to the city of Philippi and they have some great success and some, some early conversions, including Lydia, the, uh, the merchant who deals in purple dyes and cloths. Um, and everything goes, goes very well. In fact, we could probably consider the church plant at Philippi to be um, maybe Paul's best success. Um, as we work our way through the letter of the Philippians, you'll notice that there's, there doesn't seem to be many difficult or tense situations or problems that he's really addressing. It's mostly good news, kind of a celebration, some uh, amazing words about the love of God. And um, that's, uh, that's what we'll find out. We're going to read now from chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, the very beginning of the letter. Um, I should mention that this is some years later, the church is established in Philippi, and Paul is probably writing this letter from a prison cell. All right. Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you are all making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve of what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So I've been spending some of my time reading some old family letters, and of course I have to flip to the end to find out who wrote them, but not so in the Bible. The opening of all the letters in the New Testament uh, says who they are from and who they are to right there at the beginning. So Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. From servants to saints. 
actually from slaves to saints. Uh, we've talked about this Greek word doulos before. It can be translated either way, servant or slave. Um, but it, it means someone who is owned by someone else. So the thought of being owned by Christ is actually very okay with me. But Paul setting himself up as uh, a slave is foreshadowing for the beautiful words about Christ that we'll encounter in chapter 2, where it reminds us that Christ humbled himself and went from being divine to taking the form of a slave. So hierarchy is unimportant. Paul is a saint just as much as the Philippians, and they are slaves to Christ just as much as he is. This is the basis for their unity, and what he wishes for all of them is grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Take just a moment and think about that. Dwell in it grace, that, that unmerited, unconditional love, that peace, that sense of calmness, even in the midst of anxiety and trouble, grace and peace for you. In verse 3, Paul reveals that he prays constantly for the members of this church. That's a good practice, one I know comes naturally to my congregation at the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. Paul says that he prays joyfully and with gratitude. Good elements of prayer, those. It's been said that gratitude is the heart of prayer. Every day, try to think of three things that you can thank God for, even when it's tough going. Joy is a little harder to talk about. But I think we can be clear that it is not merely happiness. It has something to do with their partnership in the gospel. Paul is writing this letter from a prison cell, but he doesn't feel alone. Not only God, but his fellow church members are in a sense with him, and what a comfort that is. He can be joyous about their support. You know, support isn't really a strong enough word. He can be joyous about the sense of unity and togetherness that they share, their sense of common purpose, their joint support for the ministry of the gospel. It goes on like this. In verse 7, he says that it is right that he holds them in his heart because they are partakers with him of grace. And that bond of unity continues when his ministry is going well, and it continues when everything has crashed and he's in prison. To me, that is the constructive essence of grace. Our bond, our relationship is not at risk. My friends, my parents, my wife, my children will stick with me and love me whether I am wildly successful or if I screw up really badly. Now, I do need to insert a footnote here that a different sort of love, a tough love, is sometimes needed if you have a family member who's an addict or an abuser. But even tough love doesn't mean that you stop loving someone altogether. Tough love is just that. It's tough, but it's still love. God's love for us doesn't quit, and we shouldn't quit on each other. In most circumstances, we are called on to take the grace-filled, unconditional love that God gives to us and turn it around and give it to others. That is what Paul means when he hopes that our love will abound more and more and that love will become leavened with knowledge and discernment. For we are growing in faith. We are growing in love. Paul says this happens so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I'm actually going to end there. Seems like an odd place to end because I haven't asked you to do anything. The passage doesn't ask you to do anything either. There aren't any exhortations in it. One of my mentors in preaching once said, sometimes it is okay just to remind people that God loves them. Paul was telling the Philippians that 
And I'm telling you that God loves you. So keep on keeping on. And enough said for today. Amen. I wish you all the very best.